reads up the deterrence. Oh, another story that comes to mind. When Grant was, was, was serving in Mexico during the Mexican War, uh, he had to report to the headquarters where Lee was commanding. And Lee reprimanded him. He said, look, next time you report to headquarters, I expect you're going to be dressed a little more neatly and, and give the appearance of an officer. Guess what Lee, uh, Grant was dressed in when he met Lee? Had to surrender much spattered uniform. He left his sword behind. He apologized to Lee for his appearance. <laughs> I couldn't help but think Lee thinking, man, things haven't changed. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's what Lee wanted it to all end, and Grant said, no, we have to have a formal surrender ceremony. That will take place April 12th, the laying down of arms. And I feel honored. I was selected to be the one to preside over uh, those ceremonies. And Grant made it clear, formal, no cheering. I don't want any insults of the Confederate troops. Army of Northern Virginia, 27,000 left, out of an army of 80,000 a few years before. Clear. I took that to heart. Maybe one step further than than Grant Matt, I decided to give him a slew of one. Uh, we are figuring I'd be criticized, but this was my thinking. What better time to now start to heal the wounds of divisiveness than at the surrender center? I had it all planned. Troops were lining uh, both sides of the road leading up uh, where they were going to stack their arms up by the courthouse. And when the 3rd Brigade bugle blew the bugle, that was a signal for the Union troops to come from the parade rest position to the carry on <coughs> position. I always like to emphasize it was the second highest honor, folks, not the first. The first, the highest honor is present arms this way. General John Gordon was leading them. Uh, and you can imagine those 27,000, 28,000 Confederate troops, how dejected they would be. They were the losers. They had been defeated. They're shuffling up the road their heads down. When the 3rd Brigade bugle blew his bugle, the men came to the carry-on position. Gordon caught the significance of it. He wheeled his horse towards me, touched his saber to his boot. That was his way of saying, thank you, thank you. Turned and gave his orders to his men to return the salute in time. And what a transformation. They straightened up. Their heads lifted. Their eyes looked level into ours as they passed. At that moment, there was no longer the sound of fife or roll of drum, but an absolute stillness settled over Appomattox. And as I looked into the eyes of those Confederate troops, I thought I was witnessing the passing of the dead. They stacked their arms. For all intents and purposes, the war was over. What's the next? What's the next issue? Reconstruction. And of course, Lincoln had chosen Howard to head the Freedmen's Bureau. Of course, when he was assassinated, Andrew Johnson became uh, the president, and Johnson did acknowledge that, and he made it. Uh, Howard has an excellent plan for reconstruction, but I will tell you what my fear is. The politicians won't keep their hands up. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
I need to fulfill one thing. Maine had a population of 626,000. Volunteers numbered 72,904. Suffered over 90,000 carriers. I can find my notes. Anderscoggin County furnished over 3,000. I have the exact figures somewhere. Ah, I have. 14 times, 3,812 volunteers. Highest number came from Lawston, 1,143. Second highest from Auburn, 543. 44% of the volunteers from Anderson County came from those two towns. Mounties were paid to the men who freely volunteered to serve. Lewiston paid its volunteers the sum of $113,821 in bounties. Auburn paid its volunteers $65,275.51. The citizens of Lewiston furnished aid in the form of money and material supplies to union hospitals, men in the hospitals, the Children's Commission, $25,750, and Auburn furnished $13,000, significant contribution. State of Maine furnished aid to families well over a million dollars. So those are six. And at the Battle of Gettysburg, there were over a hundred from Lewiston and Auburn that participated in the Battle of Gettysburg. memory is six times. Yeah, the worst one at Petersburg, June 18, 1864. That ball ricocheted. Oh, any doctors in the house? <laughs> That's my great right, my greater pro right greater pro -cal. I'm giving you the medical. <laughs> the bladder where it empties into the urinary tract. My left testicle and my left acid tablet. That's what you call it. Man, what a hole that. Uh, and uh, of course, my, my obituary was published in the Philadelphia newspaper a couple days later. But you know, I'm thinking I can still survive. And guess what? A, a union general came and visited me and, and I'm supposedly on my deathbed. And I said, you know, if I could be promoted posthumously to Brigadier General, my wife would probably feel a little less pain. Grant promoted me to Brigadier General. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta be thinking all the time. How old were you when you died? How old was I when I died? Well, I anticipate I'll be about 83. <laughs> And I have a feeling that wound will be finally catch up. <laughs> when were you, how, how long after the war were you awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor? 1896. They were still awarding the medal long after. <laughs> long. Yes. Any other questions? Yes. I had heard that um, the strategy for Little Round Talk had come through some kind of a vision or Somebody came after praying. Can you confirm that? Or? Well, there's all kinds of nice little myths. Suppose, okay, uh, it was the chief of uh, the Union Engineers who, who was on a little brown top and noticed it was undefended. Now, supposedly he ordered, he ordered uh, one of his artillery pieces to fire over to the to, to, uh, Union Bridge, Seminary Bridge to see if there were Confederate troops there. And supposedly when, when the shell exploded, they all jumped up and they could see the windows. They got no, no. Why? The third main had been sent out that morning and came under heavy, heavy attack by 
Confederate troops as well as the 17th Maine and the Wheatfield. So yeah, we knew the troops uh, were there. Uh, I think my decision for the bayonet charge, I swung over to my right hemisphere. If I had used my left logical to stop and think about all the things I needed to do, we'd have been run over long before. So the right hemisphere says, charge. The left hemisphere says, do it. <laughs> I visited Fredericksburg a few years ago, and we were taken by the fact that uh, on the top of the hill that the Union Army was trying to take was their cemetery. Yeah. And, and we were told that the uh, Southern Army buried the Union soldiers there as a, a, a symbol of respect for the fact that they died so great. Is there any truth to that? No, that, that cemetery uh, was built after the war. It, it's a national cemetery. There are, uh, let me see, there's close to 14,000 Union soldiers buried there, and 13,000 don't have a name, because they don't know who they are. That's the other sad part of the war. Well, the first stone we saw was a kid from Maine. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's another interesting stone Oh, no. uh, his last name is spelled odd me, but this is what is spelled on the stone. F U C K. <laughs> we think it was supposed to be Fuch, F U C H. Somehow the H became no, serious. But it is. It's, it's, you just walk along there and you just you get very emotional. Brother Tom served with you the whole time. Tom did. Tom did well. He rose to officer's rank and did very well. Yeah. The encampment set after the Civil War, when the Southern Army and the Northern Army would come together as brothers, recognizing both had survived. Did you ever, as Chamberlain, go to any of those? No, because my wound, I was on the commission planning that event, but the wound, I was suffering terribly. I couldn't make it. Oh, by the way, of the 620,000 who died, 420,000 died of uh, sickness. They didn't die, weren't killed. 420,000 died of sickness. That's the other horror. And you can imagine the sanitary conditions, which is deplorable to say. Well, I can go home, you know. <laughs> well, I thank you. One more minute, please. Alan Elsie has something he'd like to say. Uh, there'll be a history of Lake Otter. I will also have a class. We're very eclectic here. The three stooges. <laughs> uh, there will also be one on childhood books. Books that we favored when we were children, you know, like Wizard of Oz, Alice in Wonderland. Uh, they'll also be going on games. Uh, people bring in whatever games they want to play. A lot of people like to play card games, it seems like that day. Uh, there'll also be one on uh, the Transcontinental Railroad of 1869. Uh, another one will be on William Randolph Hearst San Simeon in California, the castle. Uh, there'll be another class on electricity. Another class on collectibles, what people collect. Another one will be on the Boston Massacre Trials, which is very interesting because John Adams supported and defended the British troops. Uh, another one will be on utilizing Snapfish, which is a uh, computer program for putting your pictures on the computer. Another one will be the making of Gun with the Wind. And another one will be on World War II. Wow. So we have a full schedule for the winter. This will be February of 2012. Okay. And they're all one day. Now, okay.